making our way down from a fantastic keynote. You're going to hear from uh, Dr. Andrew Matuishin in a bit. But first, we're going to recap. Um, if this is your first time to the Ivy Cavalry Track, we tend to run a pretty curated experience, a two-day experience, where many of the speeches and guests and discussants are building upon each other for a common theme. So we're gonna, if, how many of you were here yesterday? Show of hands, okay. How many here, the, the corollary who was not here yesterday? Okay, and for those at home on video or streaming, we're gonna do a really quick recap of where we are today. So a tiny bit of summary from yesterday and then we'll outline what you should see today. So I am Josh Corman. I'm one of the founders of IamTheCavalry.org. We founded right here upstairs at B-Sides Las Vegas in 2013. So give yourselves a round of applause for 11 years of public safety service. Okay. All right, that's a long time. Um, last year, we were at a bit of a crossroads where we said, okay, it's been a decade. In some ways, we exceeded our wildest imagination on making the world a safer place where bits and bytes meet flesh and blood. Uh, and the world's getting worse faster. So I posed to the group, to each of you, uh, into our ranks of volunteers across the world, should we end it? Should we transform it into something new? Or should we combine it with other initiatives? And we spent a good chunk of day two last year workshopping a few parallel possible futures. I told you all I'd take up to three months uh, without working to try to make this hard decision. And one year later, <laughs> those three months turned out to be a much harder decision. So a couple things we said yesterday, just as a level set, if you zoom out, even since last year, and you look at our dependence on connected technology, which was growing faster than our ability to secure it, which is how we founded 2013, I've shifted to a slightly different way of saying this to policymakers. And we're going to have to shift yet again. I'll try to be a little quicker than um, intended initially. So let me just go to this. What's becoming clear to me is that this isn't just about hacking and cyber. This could be accidents for adversaries. But we are essentially having our neighbors and our communities and AARP and the general public increasingly inheriting our over-dependence on undependable things, where even accidents and adversaries can have a profound impact on public safety, economic, and national security. So the issue is we depend upon these things, but they're not dependable. And we're going to go through an adjustment period where this unwarranted trust on dangerous technology connectivity is exposed us. Now, eventually, we're going to right-size this, and we're going to have a proportional dependence to dependability. If you saw the Executive Order 14028, it was about, in large part, triggered by a response to solar winds. But there's a line in the intro that I'm quite fond of, uh, which says, in the end, the trust we place in our digital infrastructure should be proportional to how trustworthy and transparent that infrastructure is and to the consequences we will incur if that trust is misplaced. So really, this is about balance. Are we over-dependent on impenetrable things? Are we over-trusting untrustworthy things? And how much harm is this causing? So I hope there's no lies detected when I say to you that when you look at disruptions, not confidentiality, not breach records, but disruptions to lifeline critical infrastructure, we have had more disruptions, larger disruptions, longer disruptions, and more life safety affecting disruptions. Sometimes this is change healthcare, where instead of hacking a single hospital or hospital group, you hack the payment gateway upon which they all depend. And 75% or more of US hospitals and pharmacies are disrupted for months. Right? So that one to many, the systemically important entity where we put more eggs in fewer baskets, amplifying the cost of harm. So sometimes that's an over concentration of risk problem, not a cyber problem. Sometimes it's too easy to hack these and sometimes those come together. Now, that was a hack. CrowdStrike was not a hack. And yet, it did half a NotPetya of global damage. Right? NotPetya was about 10 billion in initial estimates. This was about 5 billion. So a security product without malicious intent did half the harm of the largest recorded 
cyber attack from a nation state. So because this overdependence on undependable things, our communities are now noticing these failures. So we've been on the right track for a while. We've been saying a lot of the right things. We've been doing a lot of the right things. The government is catching on too. A lot of people in this room helped cause the Patch Act to pass into law. We celebrated that last year. This requires all FDA approved medical devices have to be patchable, have to have threat models, have to have a coordinated disclosure program to work with helpful hackers without fear of retribution, have to have machine generated SBOMs or software bill of materials, have to have a vulnerability management lifecycle program. All net new medical devices are going to be safer than their predecessors going forward. It's just gonna take 15 years for us to get rid of the really old bad ones and, or longer in the secondary and tertiary markets. So we have this period where we're over dependent on unpenable things. We were prone and we were prey, but we lacked predator activity. Now we're in the messy middle on the way to some of these positive policy steps and incentive adjustments getting us to a more defensible, dependable future. But in the middle is very, very messy. And it's gonna get messier. So part of what we said is that we are over-dependent on unimpenable things. Last year I floated, maybe we shouldn't try to do everything where bits and bites meet flesh and blood, but we should focus on the areas that are most acutely harmful to basic human life, the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. Things like the water you drink, the food you put on your table, the access to timely act, uh, patient care for emergency care and power to make society run. So the water, the food, the emergency care, and the power are often owned and operated by target-rich cyber poor. This last mile is neglected. They don't participate in ISACs. They don't participate in sector courting councils. They don't know what the 16 sectors are, or CPGs, or NIST, or whatever frameworks. They don't have a single qualified security person on staff. But they're probably providing your family clean drinking water. So we don't want to become preppers, but we're in a very exposed state. Uh, David may end the day today talking about Victory Gardens. So that's a little bit of an Easter egg. But these bottom Maslow's things, the water, the food, the, f the fuel for our cars, our homes, and our supply chains, municipal power, the schools your children attend, Federal agencies challenge the state secrets and timely access to patient care with now proven mortal consequences. So, the other thing I had us reflect on yesterday is we knew during my keynote last year that we had seen out of the 7,000 hospitals that we used to track at the US level across the continental uh, landmass, we knew there were about 7,000. And I saw this study and tracking from rural hospital associations of 200 closures. And now when you talk to policymakers, they say we have 6,000 hospitals. Some of that's mergers and acquisitions. Some of that's closures and conversions. But we've lost about 1,000 of the 7,000 across the country. This one depicts 200. Yesterday, both myself and Dr. Christian Demeff pointed out there's a recent study on the financial solvency of these hospitals. And they expect another 700 plus are either at the risk of immediate closure or at the risk of closure, uh, the slightly less urgent. So they don't have money. A typical small, medium rural hospital has four to six weeks of uh, cash flow on hand in the reserves. Four to six weeks is their maximum contingency plan. And with several hundred ransoms a year, and even if it doesn't hit them, it could hit change healthcare, which is upon which they depend. If a ransom can knock you out for 12 plus weeks or several months, you're not gonna survive that. You're either gonna close or you're gonna be weakened enough to be part of an acquisition. And those acquisitions only let you survive another day to be part of a much larger blast radius where a hack of a Ascension Health can hit plural states concurrently. So we're kind of in a death spiral for your ability to get timely access to patient care. And how many of those closures would have happened anyhow? Quite a few. And people like us should maybe try to be a voice of reason to advocate to do better than we have. But how many of them are exacerbated by our insecurity on our connected technology? Now, the reason this got heavy yesterday, and I'm going to ask you once again to get comfortable with discomfort just for one more day in this room. We're going to have three uncomfortable conversations. 
as, as if this wasn't bad enough, that trajectory line of more disruptions, larger disruptions, longer disruptions, and more life safety disruptions have largely been accidents and financially motivated adversaries. But we knew in January that the top four cyber chiefs for US defense from NSA, FBI, CISA, and Office of the National Cyber Director in unclassified briefings told Congress of Volt Typhoon an example of what they call pre-positioning where we have found and evicted uh, Chinese military actors from our own water and wastewater treatment facilities. They're Swiss cheese, so it's not surprising they got in. But unlike a ransom crew, the goal would not be to monetize this, this access they currently have, but rather to do destructive work. So why 2027? If you haven't seen the hearings, please watch them and educate yourself. We don't want hyperbole, but um, their leadership has announced publicly they have intentions regarding Taiwan as early as 2027. And part of this campaign is to make sure the US stays out of it. So as a deterrent, or maybe as a warning shot, and a brushback pitch were we to get too involved, but potentially as well to do pretty serious destruction. And if you listen to anything yesterday, we know no water means no hospital. Very quickly, we know our concentration of risk on food supply is affected by these things. So these four basic lifelines are more exposed than I'm comfortable with and more exposed than you should be comfortable with. And whether you think the federal government's gonna fix this or not, we don't have a military to defend civilian infrastructure that's prone, nor do we have time in the next two and a half years to make these things unhackable. But there are things we can do. So whether it's China in 2027, 28, 29, or never, you know, the good news is we have some time like we did with Y2K, or like we did with the CISA COVID task force, but the bad news is it, we have two other conflicts on the world stage, in Israel, Gaza, and in Ukraine. So whether it's the Russians get pushed into a corner and wanna disrupt our fragile infrastructure, Iran, like we saw with Cyber Avengers, or some sort of capability, heck, uh, North Korea, we're in a place where, yes, maybe we have a formidable Roman empire, but whether you attack the city or you attack the aqueducts, you can do some pretty serious cascading harm. And we heard some great things from Dean yesterday about water supply and cascading harm. So we don't always get the time we want and the resources we want, but we do get creative in the crucible of necessity. So whether it's the Apollo 13 true story, not the fictionalized, whether it's what we marshaled for Y2K, a success story, not a false alarm, that was how I started my career, we have a lot of target-rich cyber poor, owners and operators of critical infrastructure in rural America. A lot. They can't just do best practices. So in one of the sessions, I'm gonna be joined by an official from the White House Office of National Cyber Director, who was also part of the CISA Task Force prior to her assignment there. And we did not have three years to just do implement zero trust or just do best practices. When we found vulnerable weak links in the vaccine supply chains and nitrile gloves and, Mac and a cold chain and cold storage for medical supplies, we had about three months. So if you can't do anything for three years, what can you do in three months? And the answer was a lot. You just have to get really practical. So we'll probably talk about some of these things together in the second block. David Etchew and I gave a talk like this at RSA called Getting Serious. You can watch the recording, and in it we kind of had um, some haiku about this, but this is mostly aimed at CISOs and corporate to see what assumptions do you have. A lot of people say, well, if we had an act of war, you know, we have uh, insurance for that, and they all forget things like, I don't know, exclusions for acts of war. Um, so some of our top controls and risk acceptance or risk transfer tend to be the assumptions of insurance and insurability. So if you're in your day jobs and you care about that stuff, go watch that talk. Back to why we're here. Yesterday's thesis was, let's get an update of how much more has happened in the last 12 months since we last gathered here in the desert. So we had an update from, on food supply, hungry, hungry hackers from sick codes uh, and LP. And they talked about how little flaws can have a pronounced impact on the industry and how cascading failures on our over concentration of risk can do so if you didn't see it please watch it that was followed by fantastic talk
by Dean Ford. Are you here? There's Dean. Dean is a water engineer, or an engineer who works in the water and wastewater. He's not a hacker, but he's been coming here now for the third year. He's a treasure, and he's leaned into us, and we've leaned into him, and he helped us understand how vulnerable water is, not just to shutting it off, but maybe doing destructive, long-lasting attacks. And we walked us through some Socratic cascading failure exercises that were mind-blowing. So make sure you get a chance to watch Dean. We then heard from Dr. Christian Demeff, Quadi grew up going to hacker cons for the last 20 years, and somewhere in the middle went to law school, not law school, med school, and became a physician. And it helped us found cybermedsummit.org where we do live ER hacking simulations. And now he's working at UCSD on a cyber center and an ARPA H grant. And he shared how over-dependent we are in clinical care on technology, and there's no going back, but that the trend lines are not good. In a really impassioned and very personal more personal I've ever seen him yesterday on the, where we have found ourselves and what we can do about that. And then lastly, for our four updates, we had Dr. Emma Stewart talking about power. Emma's the uh, chief scientist for the grid and a lifelong uh, expert on electricity. And she helped walk us through two scenarios and tabletops she's trying to do for national security and national capacity, including a hard reboot of the grid with increasingly te connected technology complicating that, called a black start. And we begged her to do her second scenario in the Choose Your Own Adventure, which was essentially a crowd strike, crowd struck like scenario on all the inverters for all solar panels and junctions across the grid. Both of them are pretty terrifying. So with those four, we got updates of what's happened in the last 12 months, but then we also asked to each of them, if you saw a Volt Typhoon like destructive scenario, what's our tolerance levels to that? So that's what we walked through yesterday. And then I announced a new initiative that I'll try to wrap up. So I had a very hard time making decisions on behalf of a bunch of volunteers. So the cavalry can continue to act independently, but I announced a new project for uh, as of yesterday. So let me tell you quickly about that. Um, Craig Newmark did not know what the cavalry is. Craig Newmark of Craigslist. We met earlier this spring, uh, especially when I was prepping for the Getting Started workshops at the RSA conference. And I'm going to give you the why, the what, the when, the how of this pilot that Craig is funding through IST, the Institute for Society, uh, Security and Technology. So I've accepted um, to run a project for a one-year pilot. We hope to extend. And I'll tell you how it was constructed as succinctly as possible. The why, as I started to tell you, we are over-dependent on undependable things and it's starting to be noticed by our families and our neighbors and our communities, which means we are failing them. It's not entirely our fault, but on our watch, the conversations we've been having in industry have not been enough. The last five plus years of conversations we've been having that are fruitful with public-private partnerships with the government are not enough, or rather they're gonna take longer to manifest the intended yield. And in the meantime, in this messy middle, this overdependence is rearing its ugly head in ways that none of us should be comfortable with. So that's the why we need something new and creative. The what, it's gonna be focused on, if the, the total project we focus on, the water you drink, the food you put on your table, emergency care and access to it, and power, especially in municipal settings, the last mile. The grids are much more resilient than every individual community in which you live. And we're not just looking at these in silos, we're gonna look at the cross-sector dependencies and interdependencies. So failures in any one of them can have ripple effects to all of them. So these basic lifelines are the what? The when? Well, we're adding some urgency, whether it's exactly 2027 or just a great catalyst to, to innovate in, whether it's Volt Typhoon type disruption, more accidents like CrowdStrike. If we have a war, it will be a hybrid war, and we know how vulnerable our infrastructure is. So we're adding essentially a forcing function to see what can we do prior to 2027 and working backwards. And the how, we're gonna have to try some different things. So I'm taking a page 
Andrea and I have been talking since even before the cavalry existed. If you saw her fantastic keynote, cyber terms and even resilience terms, which is the right term of art in our sector for these availability and continued access to lifeline critical infrastructure services. These have no precedence in law per se. They don't know what resilience is, but they know what safety is. They know what safety engineering is. They know what safety science is. Our neighbors don't know what resilience is, but they know what safety is. You know, when we said we're bits and bites, meat, flesh and blood, we were onto something, but we are continuing to workshop and refine our language for average citizens. So in this particular case, we're gonna take, given the short time frame and the high consequences, we're gonna take a page out of disaster science and natural disasters. And we're gonna do what you might do for hurricanes. So a hurricane is a natural disaster and we might not be able to stop it and it's gonna make landfall, but what we can do is inform, influence, inspire. What we have in our case are not natural disasters, they're unnatural disasters. And it's gonna take us a while to work through them. So they're not identical, but in the inform, influence, inspire, the more consequential a thing, the more forthright we have to be. And that doesn't mean talking amongst ourselves and doesn't mean talking to policymakers. It means talking to the people who will bear the costs of those failures. What that means is it is a sin to exaggerate and it's a sin to downplay. So we gotta say what we know, say what we don't know, and level with people so they can make informed risk decisions where they are with what they have. That's the inform. The influence is give them the best possible corrective actions as we can see them with the available time and resources. So ideally, maybe it's not implement zero trust over the next 10 years for your water and waste facility. Maybe it's not shields up. Maybe it's connections down. And maybe if they can't do the ideal risk mitigation, then we give them next best alternatives. And then on the Inspire, we're gonna have to stay in constant communication and update each other for what's working and what's not working. And encourage that if we stay in tight communication and we act on the best available information, we're gonna be okay. So inform, influence, inspire, and learn from disaster management and disaster science. And most importantly, these are not technology issues. These are hearts and minds and awareness issues. So the bulk of this pilot from Craig Newmark at IST that I'm gonna lead is a creative arts budget. We're gonna do A-B testing to find the love language, to meet people where they are, understand how they talk, understand what they care about, and make sure the, the way we're approaching them, the language we use, whether it's explainer videos or propaganda from World War II memes or reality television shows, we're gonna put everything on the table to find a way to reach and inform, influence, inspire the safest possible outcomes for these communities. So this project is not required of cavalry people, but we knew that you would be one of the first and best here at B-Sides, where it's the protectors and the puzzlers as we gather in the desert. Uh, working title for this project announced yesterday is um, Undisruptible 27. So in the face of increasing disruptions, more longer disruptions, larger disruptions, more life safety disruptions, no matter what harms are thrust upon our critical infrastructure for food, water, urgent care, and power, can our communities do the best they can to be undisruptible or at least less disruptible? So I'm asking each of you to consider what you can do to either help this new mission, but more importantly, get really selfish for a minute. Are you prepared for your household? And I don't mean become a prepper, but it is not a Herculean effort. In the unlikely event of a water landing, we know what to do every time we get on an airplane. In the unlikely event of a water landing, so similarly, if we were to have some disruption, even temporary disruption to the water supply, how have you taken steps in your own household to make sure that you are less of a drain on the community resources that are scarce? And more importantly, that you are willing and able and refreshed to help in the incident response with your natural skills. So <clears throat> if this uh, is interesting to you, there's a Slack group, we're just getting started. And I think there's gonna be a lot more resources here. Uh, Craig seems very moved. Other philanthropic groups seem very moved. And we recognize we're gradually doing a lot of the right things, including Andrea's proposal for a new regulator of last resort. But there's gonna be a messy middle. So again, we're going from the 
over dependence on unavailable things to a maybe more proportional dependence state in the future, the next few years are going to be bumpy. So we're asking you to simmer in your discomfort today and tomorrow. There'll be three uncomfortable conversations. First with Andrea Matuition, building upon her fantastic keynote to show that we have not done a very good job professionalizing and we've been so anti-professional <laughs> that if we don't set standards or have normal citizens and municipal leaders know how to spot the helpers, then the, these get defined for us. So I can't wait to see how provoking that conversation is. The middle uncomfortable conversation will be about time's up. I'll be co-facilitating with White House ONCD for a two hour block. I believe they're here in their official capacity to look hawk through some of the implications of campaigns like Volt Typhoon and making the top five list for SC Magazine. We're gonna close out the day with Bo Woods and Carl on wars, rumors of wars, and what we can track tangibly do about it um, through this exercise for the next couple hours. So thank you for being in the room. Thank you for being open-minded. Please be uncomfortable, be comfortable in your discomfort because there are things we can do in the next couple of years. We just have to make sure that we're paying attention, trying things and making sure our communities are as resilient as possible. If your household is okay, perhaps your city can be okay, perhaps your county can be okay, and perhaps we can share successful tabletops and education mechanisms and tech solutions, and we hope to tease those out through the rest of today. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up, but I look forward to working with you on this new project. Thank you.